Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Chasing Tales, Humans, Dogs, and Evolution, featuring zooarchaeologist Angela Perry. This is part of our ongoing Hot Topic series. My name is Brianna Pobener, and I'm a paleoanthropologist and educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. I'm a brown and gray-haired woman wearing a black shirt with white polka dots in front of a Zoom screen with an African savanna photo with grass and an acacia tree behind me. Whether this is your first time joining us for our Hot Topic Human Origins Today topic series, or you've attended before, we're so glad to have you here. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. This discussion offers closed captioning. You can turn the captions on or off via the CC button, which should be located at the bottom of the Zoom interface. We're in a webinar format. We can't see or hear you. So as you have questions, please go ahead and submit them to the Q&A box, which is at the top or bottom of your screen. It looks like two speech bubbles. So we can sort through as many questions as possible. The Q&A time really flies by. The Q&A box is also where we'll share any relevant links during the program, so keep an eye out there. We'll start with an opening presentation by our speaker, Dr. Angela Perry, and then I'll join her here to take your questions. During the presentation, I will also write answers to some of your questions, as well my colleague Ryan McRae from George Washington University, at least any that we can answer. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Angela Perry is an archaeologist at Chronicle Heritage and Texas A&M University with primary interest in zooarchaeology, paleoecology, and paleoenvironments. Her research primarily focuses on the nature of human environmental interactions by analyzing early relationships between humans, animals, climate, and landscapes. She's particularly interested in the effects of climate change on prehistoric animal biodiversity and human responses to these changes. So, Angela, please take it away. Great. Hopefully everyone can see that and can see me. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you to Brianna and the Smithsonian for um, inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I love talking about dogs and I'm really excited that all of you are here and hopefully have some um, good questions and discussion uh, at the end. So I named this talk Chasing Tales uh, because anyone who might follow dogs or dog evolution or the story of humans, dogs and archeology span uh, might know that the story of, of how our relationship with dogs started um, is often um, something that we're always chasing down. We don't necessarily have an answer for it. Um, and that's what I hope to talk about here today. Um, so the story of dogs is really exciting because the story of dogs is the story of us and our human ancestors. Um, the first domesticated animal domesticated by hunter gatherers and in a very short span of time has evolved from this um, timber wolf creature to you know, all sorts of small little animals that we have on um, our couches in our living room um, and that we um, spend great time and expense uh, to take care of. Um, and all of that has happened within um, a very short evolutionary period of um, probably about 20,000 years. So I usually start this um, type of talk telling people all the things that we don't know about dogs and humans and domestication and, and their evolution. Um, but we do know a few things and um, that is that dogs were domesticated from an ancient extinct um, gray wolf ancestor. Um, we know that that happened uh, at least 20,000 years ago. Uh, we've yet to find the gray wolf ancestor that dogs um, were domesticated from. We're still on the hunt for those. Um, but we know that they were domesticated by hunter-gatherers, likely the only animal domesticated by hunter-gatherers in one or more um, regions of the world. Um, and we also know that humans and wolves lived alongside each other uh, for many thousands of years prior uh, to domestication occurring and competing for prey and coming into close contact. Um, so for me, the question that kind of keeps me up at night is, what was the driver? Why now? Why here? Um, so that's what a lot of my research focuses on. Um, and probably one of the most interesting questions is how and why 
um, did we domesticate a potentially dangerous carnivore, one of our um, competitors of all of the animals um, that came after. Uh, so again, one of the things that kind of keeps me up at night. Um, one of the kind of going theories uh, about the domestication of dogs, and some of you may have seen this book and know the work of Pat Shipman quite well, is that dog domestication happened much earlier um, than we had thought sometime in the range of 40 to 30,000 years ago, um, and that humans may have actually used dogs to um, assist them in driving Neanderthals um, to extinction. Um, so this is kind of the far end of the time scale for, for what we think of as dog domestication in the 40 to 30,000 um, year range. Most of us think that domestication happened um, in much more early in the time frame. So um, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk about some of the questions people ask me most often. Um, these are questions that every time I give a dog talk, people come up to me after and say, what about this, what about this? And so I decided it might be a good place to start. Um, and the first of those questions is, uh, can we confidently identify uh, the earliest dogs? Um, so dogs are part of something um, that's kind of a, a phenomenon across domesticated animals called uh, the domestication syndrome. So we essentially see a change from the wild ancestors um, of dogs and other domesticated species to the domesticated animals that live with us today. Um, and some of these kind of phenotypic changes are related to, for example, um, a reduction in face shape and size. So there's a reason we look at dogs and think, oh, they are so cute. Look at that sweet little face. Um, they are genetically designed to um, elicit that response um, from us. Um, also, obviously, increased docility, which makes them easier to live alongside um, as compared to a, a wolf. Um, a reduction in tooth size. Uh, we also see things like floppy ears and curly tails, um, changes in coat colors, things like um, patterning and spots, and more frequent heat cycles as well. And we see some of these changes as a, a suite of, um, of traits across domesticated animals referred to as the domestication syndrome. Um, so some of you may be familiar with a, um, an experiment started in the 50s called the farm fox experiment in Siberia started by this man, um, Belayev, and his graduate student, Ludmilla Trutt, who now carries on the experiment um, up until now. Uh, this experiment is interesting for us as people who study domestication. Um, what they did was they took foxes that were being used as a fur farm and um, put them through a series of tests to um, pull out those foxes that were um, not aggressive towards um, the people who are testing them. Then they bred these docile uh, foxes with each other and created generations and generations of increasingly tame um, foxes. Along with that, um, those tame foxes came these kind of phenotypic traits that you see um, in the fox on the right. So changes in coat color, curly tails, floppy ears, um, increased docility, um, starting in only a few generations. Um, so now we're into the 80th something generation. And if you have enough money, you can buy yourself a completely domesticated um, silver fox, as you see here on a leash um, holding, holding a toy. Um, so how do we, identify domestication as archaeologists. Um, we obviously can't see a lot of these things like floppy ears or curly tails. Um, the, the number one thing we look at, of course, is um, the skeletal remains of both dogs and um, wolves. So you can see here uh, a large wolf skull in comparison um, to a Boston Terrier uh, skull. And you can see significant changes in the morphology, the shape, size, um, of the skeletal um, characteristics of these two types of animals. We also do genetic analyses. Um, some of these traits such as coat color um, or a curled tail or um, certain hair types of dogs um, can be identified um, through genetics. So we can see some um, color changes in domestic animals as well. Um, one of the things that I work on a lot is um, looking at the treatment 
of animals to determine whether they are domesticated or not. So this includes things like dog burials um, and dogs being um, buried with intentional grave goods, or you can see here some type of rope or um, leash or collar um, around the neck of this animal. And also looking at things like rock art, which depicts the relationship um, between humans and their dogs um, through time that they have um, depicted themselves of, of how they um, to the dogs in their environment and in their cultural group. So the first domesticated dog that we can in some ways all agree upon um, somewhat is this dog from a site called Bonn Oberkassel in Germany, it's dated to around 14,000 years ago. Um, this dog was found in a co-burial with two individuals, a male and a female, um, probably in their 30s. You can see the skeletal remains um, of the dog here on the right. Um, it was probably between seven and nine months old and its teeth showed evidence of having some kind of um, uh, illness or disease. Um, genetic testing later um, verified that the dog had distemper, um, which in young dogs can be fatal and may have led um, to its death. Uh, but given the skeletal characteristics, the burial with the human, um, we everyone sort of agrees that this is probably um, the earliest known dog um, in the archaeological record. So I often get asked, why is it so difficult to identify a dog versus a wolf? Um, surely um, you just, you can look at the, the skeletal remains and say it's smaller or bigger, so it's a dog or a wolf. Um, one thing that's really interesting about wolves is in some ways they're very similar to us in their morphological plasticity. So um, you can have really large wolves when we think about things like um, Arctic timber wolves um, or wolves in the northern climates, but you can also have very small, very gracile, um, thin limbed um, wolves. For example, um, wolves in Israel or Spain or Portugal. Um, you can see some examples here that are much smaller than their, um, their relatives in the northern latitudes. So this variation um, within wolves itself, very much like humans, um, makes it very difficult for us to say whether something is, for example, a small wolf or a dog in the early initial stages um, of domestication. Um, because what does the earliest dog look like? It probably looks like a wolf, right? Um, something else that kind of complicates um, the determination of something being a wolf or a dog is that no matter where you subscribe to being the location of dog domestication, some of which are depicted here, um, it's most likely that the earliest domesticated dogs encountered um, other wolves and then interbred with those wolves, um, injecting more wolf DNA and morphological characteristics um, into those early dogs. Um, so the interbreeding between wolves and early dogs um, was likely um, a, a common occurrence and is still a common occurrence in places where um, dogs are outdoors and um, are in close environment with wolves themselves. So the next question I get asked a lot a lot is, um, are there ancient breeds? Is my dog an ancient breed? Um, so colleagues and I looked at this question, well, a decade ago now. Um, so here we depicted locations where um, supposed um, ancient breeds are found in red. Um, these are all something called an ancient breed. And in green, um, we depicted the um, antiquity of dog remains in that location. So the more full the green pie is, um, the older dog remains um, are in that location. So you might see immediately some issues here, for example, in Africa or um, Australia um, or um, down here in kind of island Southeast Asia, we have some breeds that are um, thought to be ancient breeds, but we don't have the remains of dogs there um, until very late. And so what our genetic analyses and analyses of um, the dog remains themselves showed is that um, these dog breeds are not actually ancient breeds. They are in locations that were geographically and culturally isolated. So you essentially have dogs arriving in some of these locations um, like the Senjis in Africa, um, and then existing kind of on 
on their own watching her time without admixture from other dogs. And so that makes them genetically um, look ancient, but they will have had admixture from um, ancient dogs in the past. They are recently genetically or geographically and, and culturally isolated. Um, so it is true that these are some, in some ways, ancient breeds, um, but they are as admixed as any other dog uh, would be. They're just genetically, uh, geographically isolated. So probably the question we would all like to know the answer to is when, where, and why were dogs uh, domesticated? Um, I, I would also like to know the answer to this. Um, there are kind of a number of competing theories about this. Um, the first of which is that dogs may have been domesticated because they were being used, um, wolves were being used as ritual prey. So we have um, evidence of dogs, especially in Central Europe, um, in the Upper Paleolithic around 30,000 years ago. Lots of wolves that have this kind of um, crushing injury to their skulls. Um, they, their brains were probably being used for tanning hides, or something like that, potentially a ri ritualistic use. Um, but it's unlikely that this led uh, to dog domestication. Of course, the idea of taking really cute wolf pups um, is possible as well. Um, but I work with a lot of colleagues who uh, raise wolf pups now and work on um, dog cognition. Um, and many of them will tell you that it doesn't matter what you do. Um, a, a wolf is a wolf, even if you raise it from day one. Um, and so imagining what uh, a bunch of wolf pups um, that people had taken um, from uh, having killed their mothers or found orphaned and raising them in a hunter-gatherer camp with children running around and, and the wolf pups becoming difficult to manage. Um, it seems like this may be an unlikely scenario. Um, another um, hypothesis that people have put forward is perhaps dogs were used as hunting partners uh, for humans, that um, you know, they were existing together on the landscape, hunting the same prey species, and that that led to a natural relationship um, between humans and dogs. Um, so some of the research that I did with colleagues recently, um, they, this is rock art coming from Saudi Arabia, um, depicts human hunters, you can see here hunters um, with bows and many, many dogs, um, which they were likely using um, for hunting. You can see here another depiction of two dogs and a hunter um, with a lion. Um, this depiction shows um, a group of dogs with a single um, hunter and some of these dogs even have leashes. It's the earliest depiction of um, leashed dogs um, coming from the hunter um, self. You can see more depictions of, of leashes here as well. And these dogs are interesting. Um, they, they have a very um, specific patterning. Uh, when my colleagues came to me uh, with this rock art and asked me um, what what I thought these dogs were and what I thought um, these were. They, they thought it may be um, artists depicting like vo vocals of dogs or dogs barking or, or something like that. Um, and we had a long discussion about the possibility that these might be depicting um, this dog, which has um, this kind of white coloring you can see here on its, on its chest. And also many of these dogs had this type of marking on their shoulders, which you can see here on this Canaan dog, um, which is actually this, the national dog of Israel um, and is thought to have come from the deserts of, of Saudi Arabia. Um, it's very similar in its curled tail, pricked ears, this kind of um, sloped chest here. Um, so we know that there are very, very early depictions of dogs. These, um, this rock art comes from potentially around nine to 8,000 years ago. Um, so we know that people were using dogs um, as hunting partners um, for many thousands of years. The final kind of hypothesis and probably um, the hypothesis that is um, most subscribed to by dog researchers now is the trash pile scavenger hypothesis. Um, essentially that as humans, we are messy. We leave our trash on the ground and that um, wolves 20,000 years ago, much like raccoons, foxes, bears, and every other animal now that find our trash, um, decided that um, survival off of our trash piles or our leftover carcasses was not the worst way uh, to survive. Um, 
So I was having a think about this idea and um, and trying to think about places where um, wolves and dogs might have had the opportunity to kind of be in the same location for um, a sustained amount of time, long enough for a wolf population to um, decide to depend on humans and raise successive generations of their wolf pups, um, needing to survive only off of human uh, remains and human trash. Um, and during this, this kind of process of thinking through where, where would wolves and humans have been um, long enough for something like this to happen in the same location um, with humans kind of stopped in one place, building up enough of a trash pile for wolves to live off of. Um, I was thinking about the peopling of the Americas um, and the idea that before entering the Americas, um, people, ancestors of Native Americans were likely isolated on the um, Siberian side of Beringia for some period of thousands of years and most likely wolves were isolated there with them. Um, so, a colleague, two colleagues of mine, um, we, we locked ourselves in a room in Oxford. Um, you could see here on November 6th, 2018, uh, we locked ourselves in the room and brainstormed the idea of um, combining dog and human DNA and dates for the peopling of the Americas and the arrival of dogs and humans into the Americas um, and what they might have been doing on the Siberian side of the Americas prior to that um, arrival. So this mess, um, which we were quite proud of, you can see my colleague Gregor Larson here, um, became this, uh, this figure in, in our publication. Um, and it, it's a lot of arrows and various things pointing in various directions, all of which say, that um, the DNA and dating of dogs and humans um, at the time of the peopling of the Americas is, is, is very similar. Um, and the genetic population splits of dogs um, told us that we had two groups of dogs um, that were both groups of dogs that had a common ancestor um, that they split from around 23,000 years ago. Um, and we don't have the physical remains of this dog, but we can see genetically using a molecular clock, um, working backwards in the genetics, um, that there was a common ancestor for two groups of dogs around 23,000 years ago. So that gives us a pretty good idea that dog domestication was happen has happened at least 23,000 years ago. Um, and also that it's quite possible that that domestication happened um, in Siberia itself, as these are two populations of um, Arctic, um, Siberian, um, northern latitude dogs. Um, and at that same time, the last glacial maximum was occurring. Humans and other animals were isolated in northeast Siberia for a period of many thousands of years, two to 9,000 years probably. And this would have made a really um, ideal setting for humans to be hunkering down, um, surviving the last glacial maximum and living in this kind of refugium um, isolation and also wolves to be doing the same thing. Um, and so we propose in this paper that um, the ancestors of Native Americans in Northeast Siberia uh, may have actually been the ones who first domesticated dogs and then brought them over um, into the Americas with them. So once in the Americas, um, some of the, they, they moved pretty quickly through the Americas, humans and dogs. And some of the earliest remains that we have um, are some dogs that I worked on at the sites of Stillwell and Coster in Illinois. Some of you might know the Coster site. It's quite famous. It was located in the 60s and 70s over the period of a decade. Archaeologists love seeing these um, old pictures of excavations. Um, Coster was a really amazing site and told us a lot about the mid-continent um, from beginning in, in the archaic um, all the way through um, into historic period. And we found five dogs at that, at that site. This is one of them. Um, these dogs have been excavated in the 70s, as you can see here. Um, we recently redated them, um, dating to around 10,000 years ago. Um, so these are quite old um, for the Americas, some of the oldest dogs um, that we know of. 
Um, we also discovered in an old box um, another dog that was found here. Um, it was found in the 70s during the widening um, of a highway in Illinois. And you can see it was found there in that, that hole. This is the only picture of it that exists from um, in situ prior to excavation. It also dated to um, the exact same time period as that Coster dog. Um, and you can see that they're not huge dogs. We would think maybe the earliest dogs would be um, really massive wolf-like dogs, but already by 10,000 years ago, so potentially a span of 13,000 years since domestication, um, the dogs have already become um, kind of medium-sized dogs. Um, these are the mandibles, the jaw bones of um, the lower two are from those coster dogs, and the top one is from that Stillwell dog that was found um, on the side of the highway um, expansion. And you can see um, that there's some difference between these two types of dogs. Um, the Stillwell dog is clearly um, a more robust dog, a thicker um, mandible, while the Coster dogs are more gracile, this kind of thinner um, mandible um, with uh, this different kind of um, extension here of, of the top part of the mandible. Um, and they are very close to each other, maybe 20 kilometers away and overlap in time. So um, we did some genetic analyses of these to try to determine why two groups of dogs in sites very close to each other that overlapped would look um, so different. And what we discovered is that um, the, the two Coster dogs that we tested had very recent coyote ancestry, um, probably a parent that was actually a coyote. So they are essentially koi dogs. So we have groups of people who are living um, with koi dogs and burying koi dogs as, um, as part of, of their, um, their domestic sphere. Um, so that's really interesting to think about um, the relationship between coyotes and dogs as well. Um, so we use those coster dogs as a basis of, of some of our recent work um, to try to better understand dogs in the Americas and what they look like genetically and how they're related to other dogs across the world. Um, and what we determined is that what we call pre-contact dogs, dogs that are that arrived into the Americas with um, the first Native American ancestors, are all um, in one group very closely related. And again, very closely related to Arctic dogs, both American and Eurasian Arctic dogs. So American dogs are really on their own as a group. Um, and what this looks like for the arrival of dogs into the Americas is that there was a first introduction of dogs when people arrived into the Americas. And then a second, at the time I made this slide originally, we thought it was a potential introduction, but we since um, produced another paper that showed that the Thule migration, again, um, coming from across Siberia, across Beringia, um, into Northern Canada and over to Greenland, that Thule migration brought another group of dogs with it. And then of course, a third introduction of dogs with European colonizers. And then a fourth introduction again of Arctic dogs um, associated with the gold rush um, and more husky type dogs. So I always like to end a talk like this with probably one of my most um, asked questions, which is um, if I wanted an ancient dog, what would I get? Um, we've tested thousands and thousands and thousands of um, modern dogs now to determine if um, any dogs uh, contain this original pre-contact dog um, DNA um, that may be the kind of stock population that led to um, the proliferation of dogs across the world. Um, and the most closely related dogs, if you would like to have yourself um, an ancient dog, would be the Arctic breeds, so Malamutes, um, Siberian, and Alaskan Huskies. And this guy who is um, a rare primitive breed in the Americas called the Carolina dog. Um, and we have a number of Carolina dogs um, that show a um, uh, some percentage of this original um, pre-contact dog. So there you go. So again, really exciting uh, to think about what dogs are um, hiding in terms of secrets about not only themselves and domestication, but us as humans. Um, and the evolution of our relationship uh, with other animals. So I thank you all for being here um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have.
Fantastic. Thank you. That was a really fun talk um, and really interesting. And we already have some questions that have come in. So I think we will um, jump right in. And so the first question is actually two separate questions um, from Tad. And he says, thanks for the fascinating presentation, Angela. Two questions. The first one, why don't I ask the first one and then I'll ask the second one afterwards. Okay. Um, the first one, if it's trash piles, why dogs? As opposed to all the other animals you mentioned who also hang out at human trash piles. Right, good question. Um, why dogs? Well, we have other animals that do it now, right? So I think probably people who live in Alaska would say um, bears and foxes and other animals are hanging out at their trash piles all the time. But I think I, I'm a subscriber to the idea that um, we did not domesticate dogs. Um, you, when I put myself in the mindset of a hunter-gatherer who has never seen a domesticated plant or animal, Right? The concept of domestication to us is obvious. The concept of that you can domesticate a plant or animal for a hunter-gatherer of that time period is, is not obvious. And so I think it's most likely that um, wolves essentially domesticate themselves, right? Um, just like, you know, I think about my dogs and I think my dog does nothing. I feed it, I pick up after it, I do everything, right? They have a pretty great life and I think, um, it's most likely that wolves figured out that instead of um, um, continuing on with um, highly risky hunting that often leads to injuries and death and competition with other wolves, that they found this other sub subsistence practice, right? And that is that if you follow the humans around, they drop their trash. And that's a pretty easy life. <laughs> You're not fighting other wolves for anything. You're not trying to track down dangerous prey. You're just following the humans. And that, um, you know, like people in Alaska with bears, that if you, if you don't do anything dangerous, the, the humans will probably let you get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and not run you off and not really mind that you're there. And that that process of increasing proximity and increasingly being comfortable with a wild animal just outside your village or just outside your camp um, it's probably over generations um, of wolves um, not only choosing this lifestyle but then in some ways maybe unable to choose anything differently because they have generations of wolf pups that are continuing on in this type of subsistence practice so I don't think it was a, a choice I think it was um, more of the wolves deciding that this is a great way to survive. <laughs> That's excellent. And actually, this is, before I ask Tad's second question, this is a wonderful comment that follows on with what you just said. Um, and the comment is, hi, I'm John and I'm 10. I just love prehistory. Dogs domesticated themselves, I think, just like cats. Yes. And those of us who are cat owners also might have questions about whether cats are, are they domesticated. domesticated. <laughs> well, I'm just joking. Anyway, let me- <laughs> I will Yes, turn John, back. you're right. <laughs> That's right. Um, let me turn back to Tad's second question before we go on to some other questions. Um, you said that humans were isolated in Northeast Siberia for 9,000 years. Why? There was no ice sheet to their south, right? Yeah. So uh, there's debate right now about how long that isolation occurred for. Was it 2,000 years? Was it 9,000 years? Was it more? Mm -hmm. um, they essentially... They're... <laughs> There's a refugium in that part of Siberia where um, the climate and the um, animals and plants that were living there were, um, were essentially in a little refugium that was easier to survive than the rest of what was going on in, in further west and south um, in Siberia. So mm -hmm. essentially a, a, a group of humans and probably animals kind of stopped up there and figured like, let's, it's not like a neighborhood, right? It's a pretty large area. <laughs> um, but they they figured that instead of going this way uh, um, across or this way back down into dealing with the LGM where it's pretty nasty, pretty nasty climate happening in the rest of Siberia, they would just stay in this kind of isolated location. And we think that they were probably genetically isolated from other populations for very long periods of time. We don't have any evidence of um, human genetic influx to those populations for a period of 20,000 years. So we think once humans were in Siberia that they were somewhat isolated in, in that area for genetically for quite a long period of time. Um, 
and during the LGM, the late glacial maximum, mm -hmm. um, for yeah, who knows, thousands of years, um, which gives us the perfect driver to understand. You know, I've always wondered why now. What what why did they decide after thousands of years of seeing wolves that like this would happen now? Um, and isolation is is a good reason. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting hypothesis. Um, so here's a question from Paul, who says, hello, Angela and Brianna. I understand that the wolf evolved around 1 million years ago from the Miasis, and I may be mispronouncing that. It's M-I-A-C-I-S, which I, I'm not aware of. Do you think our distant ancestors would have had contact with these early wolves? And if so, would this put back the date for early domestication? I mean... It's a good question. I don't think anyone has ever looked um, that far back, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Um, I think, yeah, that's something I don't. I, I genuinely don't have the answer to. I work on dire wolves, which is a little bit further back. Um, mm -hmm. And we think that there may have been a short period of overlap between humans and dire wolves. And we have mm -hmm. some really small dire wolves in some locations that mm -hmm. there's some questions about. Um, but very early, that far back, yeah, I would have no idea. Um, that's a good question, though. Um, here's an interesting question from Andrea, who says, hi, really interesting. Thanks. Is it possible that dogs, by eating our trash, helped us with hygiene or protected us against mm -hmm. dispersion of pathogens? Yeah, I think this is one of the um, kind of main uses of dogs, actually. Dogs are... You know, when I work with populations um, who use dogs for hunting or subsistence now, um, you know, a, a dog is kind of a Swiss army knife. It can do lots of things. Um, and this is documented over and over and over in historic literature of, of what people do with their dogs. So you may have a sled dog, but it also may help you with hunting. It cleans up around the camp. It's protection and alarm system. Um, in times of need, it's a fur and food source. Um, so dogs are really great at all of these things and um, picking up waste around um, a village or camp encampment is a really good use of dogs as well. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting question from Michelle. Do you have information on when the rabies variant in dogs developed? Oh, um, there's a has it come out yet? There's a paper coming, if it's, if it's not out yet, um, that, because there's, there's been a question of um, rabies arising in, a, in the Americas itself, or if it was brought um, from, from Eurasia. And so um, I believe that new information will show that the, um, the rabies that's in dogs is derived from sea lion rabies, um, and that there's some relationship uh, relationship there. But other than that, I do not have the answer of when um, rabies uh, arised. But one of the questions that's really interesting to me is the arrival of humans and dogs in the Americas and the potential diseases and pathogens that dogs themselves may have introduced to native fauna in the Americas, um, like dire wolves, um, other canids, um, other carnivores. So yeah, that's a it's a good question if they had it and brought it over into the Americas with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's another question from John, age 10, who says, here's my question about cave art. All the books at the library are about French caves or some from Spain, mm -hmm. but you said the one behind you is from Saudi Arabia. What's the name of the cave so I can look for something to read? Um, this one is not a cave. Um, this one is uh, open rock art and um, I will be happy to send you the paper that has all of it in it. It's, it's our paper from a couple of years ago. Um, the and I can have it put in, you know, the chat. It's two sites called Shoemus and Juba, J U B B A H. Um, or if you just Google Saudi Saudi Arabia dog rock art, it will definitely come up in various contexts. So, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Ty. Hi. Have any artifacts been discovered that show early uses of hardware with dogs, like harnesses, packs, collars, mm. etc.? Yes, I had a really good slide that I had to cut for time. 
Um, we have some very exciting sledding material um, from a site called Zhukov Island, which is in the New Siberian Sea now. It was previously um, on land. And um, that dates to around probably 9,000 years ago. And it's very clearly dog sledding um, material. So it's got toggle harnesses that are nearly identical to toggle harnesses used for dog sledding now. Um, the sled runners, um, a lot of the leather um, is still preserved. Um, so I think I used to be a proponent of hunting first, that hunting was the first use of dog, but um, I've come around to thinking it was probably sledding, um, especially if domestication occurred in Siberia um, or the Northern latitudes, sledding was probably um, the first use of dogs. And, and there is a lot of early evidence for that um, well-preserved in the Northern latitudes. Very cool, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question from Patricia. Has a human genetic trait evolved that helps humans to be positively predisposed to dogs? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I know that um, dogs and humans share um, many similar tr genetic traits um, that have the same phenotypic expression in both dogs and humans. For example, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a gene in dogs that is nearly identical to a gene in humans that expresses as Williams syndrome, which is um, kind of a phenotypic. People of Williams syndrome are very friendly, very um, inviting and open and welcome. And that's a similar trait that we find in, in dogs of similar genetic um, characteristic. Um, hmm. So we have a lot of similarities between us. And this is why dogs are often used as proxies um, for a lot of um, human medical research as well. Cool. Um, so here's a sort of question slash comment. This is from Marilyn who says, if domestication isn't obvious to humans, how did they start domesticating plants? Which I know are different process. Um, she said, I can't agree that humans would not have thought of domesticating dogs. It's probably a combination of the humans and the wolves being near each other that led to domestication. Yeah. Um, plants, I think you're going to have my colleague Heather um, coming up at some near future talking about plant domestication. Um, but yeah, I think we know that once dogs were domesticated or domesticated themselves, that um, it was a sort of a domino effect. Um, once the first livestock species was domesticated, then we have domestication happening um, in a kind of domino effect of, of many uh, livestock species, pigs, um, horses, chickens, all of that. Um, and then someone else, I think John mentioned that cats in some ways domesticated themselves. I'm not sure if cats are domesticated either, but um, <laughs> the cats essentially domesticated themselves by this idea of close proximity to humans and increasing docility on both sides. Um, so it is possible, I, it is possible that humans looked at increasingly docile wolves that had been living alongside them for long periods of time. But again, I always go back to like asking an Alaskan person who lives in the bush, like, do you ever think about domesticating a bear? <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> there's still wild animals that are, they lived alongside us for a long time and we kind of stay out of their way, but you don't necessarily think I could get out there and domesticate that thing. <laughs> that, so yeah, especially a carnivore that isn't necessarily mm. a food source or, do mm -hmm. milk source or doing anything necessarily for you. So that's always the question of why two of our earliest domesticates are carnivores that, mm -hmm. you know, must have must have domesticated themselves in many ways. So what's the other one if one is dogs? Well, cats. Cats, cats. OK. Yeah, cats are yeah. domesticated probably. I think there's some new research coming out, but somewhere in just after agricultural arrival mm. in, in like Cyprus and that area. So probably around nine, 10,000 years ago, you, you have cats coming along as well. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, domestication of carnivores is a real mm -hmm. mystery why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a question from 
us and the behind the scenes team. Um, is there a difference between domesticated and cultivated or managed? And is the archeological record, if there is sort of precise enough to allow us to distinguish between those as mm -hmm. maybe like points in a process or something like that? Yeah, so not necessarily for dogs, but my colleagues who work mm -hmm. on things like horses or donkeys or mm -hmm. um, cattle or things like that. So one of the pictures, um, though some of the rock art we have in Saudi Arabia um, depicts a, a gazelle that has like some kind of rope around its neck that's, that's tethered. And so for livestock animals, um, it's most likely that some type of like herd management or cultivation mm -hmm. was an initial step in the domestication process, mm -hmm. um, whether that was something along the lines of, if we keep females penned up, the males will come and we can kill them, but we're not necessarily attempting to domesticate the females. We just are using them as a, as, you know, bait in some bait. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bait in some way, or, you know, we have lots of depictions in um, various parts of the Middle East and Near East, of, like kites, these places where they try to run wild animals in and then sometimes keep them corralled um, and sometimes kill them. So I think management in some way was probably a first step, I think, potentially, you know, capturing animals like horses and, and milking them, but not necessarily have, domesticating them is probably mm -hmm. also a step in that as well. Um, as far as morphologically, there again in livestock, um, there are people who do really precise measurements of morphology um, and um, things like bit wear and um, changes in um, uh, uh, trauma to the legs or something like that to show horses are being ridden in this kind of early stages of domestication or cultivation in those kind of livestock species. Cool. Um, here's a, I, actually a really nice follow on question from Will who asks, did wolves being pack animals possibly help with their domestication since at least some of them were submissive? Yes, um, they did. And I, I, I would think they did. And I think this idea that there are some submissive animals um, so I do a lot of work with wolf researchers and asking them about the behavior of wolves and why do they do this? And um, we know it's very common for especially young males to split off on their own and go to like kind of establish their own packs um, or be lone wolves for some, um, for some time period. And it is possible that this is the way that um, this, if we're right about the trash pile scavengers that, you know, a lone wolf or two started kind of following on humans as a kind of easy meal instead of trying mm -hmm. to hunt down something on their own and that after a number of generations that you know wolves raise their young with them and teach them how to hunt the prey species that they hunt and a lot of research shows that you know wolves that were raised to hunt deer are not good at hunting boar because they were raised to hunt deer and that's what they were taught. And so you can imagine a scenario in which successive generations of wolf pups that have only been raised to eat trash might not be the greatest hunters to survive on their own. And so this process of now we're dependent on humans and their trash um, mm. may be what led to domestication itself. Yeah. Interesting. So um, I'm going to take prerogative and ask a question. And my question is, what are you working on now? And sort of what are the questions that you're asking and how are you looking to answer them? Yeah, a lot of um, the work that I'm doing with uh, my colleagues now is related to working dogs, ancient working dogs. Um, so we are working now on Salish wool dogs, um, which is a now extinct um, breed of dogs from um, the Pacific Northwest coast um, that were used as essentially a, a dog wool economy um, that peoples mm. on the Northwest coast, Coast Salish and Salish peoples um, uh, use their wool to create blankets and, and capes and all sorts of things. And so we've been uh, doing a lot of work actually with colleagues at the Smithsonian um, to look at some of these materials that have survived and do isotopic analysis and genetic analyses. 
um, to determine if these dogs were kind of their own breed. And we've determined lots of really exciting things about them. Like they, had, they did in fact have a special type of hair that was very good for weaving, um, that was a specific color um, and that they are very closely associated. And um, the antiquity of these dogs goes back um, quite far um, into time, just as Coast Salish peoples have always told us <laughs> they did, mm. um, right? So it's a really nice, um, uh, I think, justification for the Coast Salish and Salish peoples who have been telling us for long periods of time that this is their history with dogs. Um, so yeah, and we have worked with a lot of Coast Salish elders on that paper, and it's been really exciting. Excellent. And for those of you who are longtime Hot Topic um, followers, you may have seen Audrey Lynn's Hot Topic a while back, um, who is, I think, part of this project. And I believe she even talked about um, some of this research. So that's that's kind of fun. Um, and exactly. if you haven't, you will be able to, um, you can look on the um, NMNH video webinar archives page where you can find actually recordings of all of our past Hot Topics. Um, here's a really interesting question from um, Elle. Like the mammoth attempts, is there any chance of bringing an extinct dog species back? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I wish. Um, so we we really wanted to find out with the um, pre-contact dogs, the um, American, original ancient American dogs, um, if we could find any dogs. But like I said, we have um, we have Arctic dogs, Siberian Huskies, Malamutes that um, are coming from that Thule migration. So they're the ancestors of Thule migrations. So maybe a thousand years um, ago, um, Carolina dogs and a very few handful of um, various Central and South American dogs have some slight ancestry left in them of these pre-contact dogs. Um, but other than that, we've yet to find any kind of ancient, ancient dog. Um, can we bring them back? Probably not. Um, yeah, I think um, it's that's unlikely. We're with the genetic analysis we're doing with Audrey on the Coast Salish dogs. We are interested to see if that very specific haplotype exists still in localized Pacific Northwest um, coast mm -hmm. dogs. That's a possibility. Some of these kind of um, more isolated um, ancient breed groups, they might have um, isolated populations somewhere that would have higher. Um, higher ancestry of this ancient dog. Um, but like our paper, you know, a decade ago showed there, there isn't really an ancient dog or ancient breeds left because dogs are so prone to admixture. They're so prone to breeding with each other the second they come into contact with each other. Um, there's admixture and inbreeding. Um, so yeah, unlikely. Okay. A Carolina enough. dog. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I am, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but I do want to ask one, I guess, sort of more personal question, but do you have a dog or what's your favorite dog? Yes, I, um, <laughs> I, I have dogs. I have too many dogs. Um, and I, um, from early on, from when I was a kid, I've always had Westies, you know, small little Highland Highland dogs. Um, I like a terrier because they've got a lot of attitude. Um, but if I were to get more dogs going forward, I'd probably get myself a really nice, chill, like livestock guarding dog, like a great Pyrenees or something like that, that just likes to like sleep and guard sheep or something like that. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. I think, let me just check if there's any more questions. Oh. Um, let me just last comment who's come in from um, John, our 10 year old, who's asked some great questions. Not a question, but just telling Angela Perry that I see her name in the link to the science journal that she sent me. I will read it with some help. Thank you. Oh, so thank awesome. you very much. Thanks, John. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I think um, we will go ahead and wrap up um, and conclude today's virtual program. So please join me in thanking Dr. Perry for sharing her work with us. I'd also lived, uh, excuse me, I'd also like to give special thanks to those who made this program possible. This is our behind the scenes team who helps sort through your questions, including Ryan McRae from George Washington University, to our donors, volunteers, and viewers like you. And finally, to all our partners who help us reach, educate, and empower millions of people around the world today and every day, we thank you. 
This was our last hot topic, Human Origins Today topic for this season, but we will pick back up in September um, with Dr. Heather Thakar, who Angela mentioned before, um, who will be talking about domestication in plants, particularly in corn. That will be September 21st from um, 11.30 a.m., same time as usual. Um, and then, um, so we'll be taking a break for the summer. We've put a link in the Q&A where you can find information about our upcoming programs and how to sign up for the museum's weekly e-newsletter. That's the best way to stay informed on upcoming programs and to learn more about the museum's research and exhibitions. After this webinar ends, you'll see a survey pop up asking for some feedback about the program. Please take a moment to respond. We're very curious to know what topics you might be interested in seeing for future programs, and we appreciate your input. Again, Thank you to our participants, to Dr. Perry, and to you, the audience. We will see you in September.